It's certainly a pleasure to be here to wrap up this very impressive conference. I'd like to thank again the uh, NCPP uh, or the National Center for Pavement Preservation to uh, the, the organization they did not only with the technical sessions but also with the field demonstrations was outstanding. I, I know that uh, the partnership gave me an extra five minutes to talk so I, I have tried to cut my presentation down for 30 minutes but I'll try to be speedy because I know a lot of people are gone and a lot of people have flights to catch. So I don't know how this got started but uh, I'm doing it a little bit, this wrap up a little bit different. I, I'm going to start with a little bit of history of pavement preservation. I know Rick Church has given some of that and, and others have given some but I want to uh, kind of repeat it because I think it's very important of how we got from the 90s to how we got to today. And then we'll go through some of the conference sessions, uh, cover some of the types of preservation treatments and benefits. We, we always want to talk about the benefits, but there are still remaining challenges and opportunities that need to be discussed. And uh, then I highlighted some of the conference takeaways. I remember, remember George talking about uh, be, give, and take. Well, these are the takeaways that you're going to have that I'll cover. And then I wanted to kind of take a look at the path forward. I know Rich discussed the path forward as well. But the history of preservation, many of you are not my age. I've been around from the beginning and I'm probably one of the older people here on the stage. But it started, the history prior to 1992, most preservation treatments were just called maintenance, of course, that you know that. They're reactive, uh, not proactive or preventative. You want me to smile? Okay. Uh, it was more of an art than science, and we're becoming more scientific as we develop new national specs and uh, new material specs and new construction guides. Since then, materials have changed. They've improved because we've got a lot of new additives, polymers, things of that sort. Equipment has changed greatly. Design practices, however, have not. Many people still design ship seals based on experience. Uh, the ISSA uh, slurry seal uh, techniques were based on uh, tests developed back in the 70s by Ben Benedict and even though they've improved there still could be more improvement in the test methods and the protocols. Uh, quality control practices. You, you look at what NCAT had uh, and Minroad had on their test sections. They had good contractors, good materials, good inspection. You can expect that their life extensions are going to be the highest because they had an A team on their project all the time. I look around at, uh, in California, and I'm sure you can look around in other places, that you don't always get the A team on your preservation projects. And as a result, I get called in for litigation a number of times to, on behalf of the agency to see what happened. So quality control practices need to be improved. So do you remember what FPRMR stands for? Foundation for Pavement Maintenance and Reconstruction. No, it's, that's close. <laughs> Foundation for Pavement Research, Pavement Rehabilitation and Maintenance Research. Okay? And uh, the early players were people from Coke, uh, Bill Ballou and Michael Leary. I don't know if most of you know uh, Michael Leary but, uh, or Bill Ballou, but you certainly probably know uh, inherited of Jim Sorensen and Jim Moulthrop. He was also with Coke at the time. And then I was the only academia involved in going out and trying to raise funds, just like NCAT had raised funds to set up their center. I got involved with these other folks to raise funds so that we could have a, a, a base amount of money to work with. 
And of course that eventually happened, but all of them were looking forward to Coke providing the biggest share because they had the biggest share of the preservation industry. Of course, as Rick Church said earlier, Epi 2 was changed in 1999, or formed, renamed in 1999, and then re, uh, uh, reinvented in 2009. So these are some of the changes in history. Of course, uh, see, did I skip? there were early challenges. Now Rick Church, someone said Rick Church looked like or was uh, like Jim Sorensen. It doesn't look like him, but maybe they have the same mentality. But Jim, I first met him in Portland when, when he was, Portland, Oregon, when he was the regional payments engineer for the region in, in, that represented Oregon, uh, Washington, and Alaska. And he was just as pushy then as he was later in life. If he had some idea he wanted done, he found out who could do it, and then he pulled him or dragged him along to completion. I enjoy Jim very much, and I really miss having him around. Of course, the early challenge that when we started doing MP2, the HMA contractors didn't, didn't support it, but Jim persisted and everything paid off. Other efforts, we're lobbying to enhance visibility. Rick talked about that as an effort of FP2, and, and of course, Moltrup was one of the longtime directors of FP2. Uh, he talked about the support of the National Center in Michigan State, and we also uh, have talked about the, some of the implementation. The International Conference, that was the first effort of Jim Sorensen and it occurred just after he had died. He asked myself and uh, Laura Melendi of the University of California, Berkeley, to put this thing on, and we had about 600 people at Newport Beach in 2010. At that time, uh, we required papers, but we found out we didn't get good representation from industry or others, so since then, that program style has changed. Uh, and uh, in I missed, I, I'm getting old, I missed 2012. I attended 2012 National Conference in Nashville. I attended 2016 and I'm, of course, here in 2023 and I hope still to be around for the, the next conference in four years. Uh, implementation, uh, we just heard from the regional partnerships and their importance and they have made a lot of contributions in like George has said they're the spear to making sure pavement preservation works throughout the country. And the ASHA uh, TSP2 program, I don't know what it's going to be named next, but I know George <coughs> does. But uh, I've worked on that for an, a number of years, and I've turned over my role to my colleague at Chico State, uh, Ding Chung. You want to raise your hand, Ding? And, uh, Colin Franco was the driver for this effort, and I really admire what he did. In, he's, he's more like Jim Sorensen than, than Rick Church, I think. He, he pushed and pushed and pushed. Current efforts, of course, uh, Bouzid is doing a lot. Rick is still involved. You've got the Pavement Preservation Partnerships, which you've heard about. Uh, you've heard from uh, ACPA and IGGA, NAPA, the As Asphalt Institute, NCAT, and uh, MinRoad have done outstanding work. The work that's been done at MinRoad and, uh, and NCAT is really to be commended. And I think the presentations by the folks the other day were really uh, informative and they demonstrate clearly the benefits particularly in life extension of, of uh, pavement preservation treatments. TRB formed in, I think, 2009, Pavement Preservation Committees, and uh, sometime around then. And uh, of course, we've had representation from NASEN, uh, APWA here, and our CP2 Center has done a lot in the western part of the state. We put out a newsletter, I know Tom gets it and likes it, and I don't know if any of you 
get it, but if you don't, I, you can contact me. Uh, I, my email is at the end of the presentation, and uh, we can get you on the uh, mailing list. I think we have over 5,000 people on our mailing list. Uh, what did you say? Uh, it was about 4,000 on yours, Tom? Uh, we've got about uh, close to 5,000. Okay, so about the same number of people, but I'm sure different people. Now, the conference sessions that you set in include payment, uh, fund I mean, fundamentals. I'm going to go through a lot of these. It includes materials and treatments, advancing the practice. I participated in workforce development, and that was an excellent presentation uh, that was given by the, the presenters. Data and analysis, test roads, and moving ahead. Unfortunately, I couldn't sit in all the presentations, so I had to rely on other people to provide some feedback. But uh, the preservation treatments, of course, were the highlight not only of the, the conference, but also of the uh, field demonstrations. For example, common treatments that are used, crack sealing. You saw the new robotic crack sealing device that is coming along. And you can probably expect a lot more artificial intelligence in the future because uh, that is just the, the beginning of uh, these developments. Fog seals, you saw a rejuvenating seal at the project put down by Colin uh, Durante. And uh, it's a reclamite product that was developed in California at Whitco Chemical back in the 60s. It's been around for a long time. In fact, I worked with a guy uh, when I graduated from <coughs> college that developed the product, and it's been around since the 60s. He was a chemist named Fritz Rossler. Most of you probably don't know him, but that's all right. He was a great guy. Chip and scrub seals. We saw a scrub seal go down. We use a lot of scrub seals in California. They are mass uh, crack sealers, and they work exceptionally well. We use rejuvenating agents, and and they work really well. Slurries or slurry systems, including slurry seals and microsurfacings. You saw a micro go down out on the test track. Uh, cape seals, we use a lot of cape seals. That's multi-layer systems. Uh, initially a chip seal followed by either a micro or a slurry, or we use multi-layer systems. Maybe a, 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 a micro followed by a chip seal followed by another micro. And those prove very effective on roads with PCIs as low as 40, and they uh, particularly lower volume roads. So they, they work quite well. Thin bonded wearing courses, we didn't see any of that. Thin uh, HMO, uh, HMAO overlays, we didn't see that. But we did see the hot in place recycling. And I thought that was pretty impressive. I don't know what you thought, but that was a pretty impressive operation. Of course, we've used. Uh, hot in place recycling in California where there might be four heaters. They only used two heaters yesterday and this was just a heater scarification operation. But four heaters can really get the temperature up and you can add new material as well. So hot in place recycling is an option. CIR, I, I know back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there were two states that took the initiative on CIR. One was Oregon, and I worked with a guy named Charlie Valentine, who many people probably remember. He's long past. His son ran his operation afterwards, but we did hundreds of miles of CIR in eastern Oregon, and it was the same thing. I mean, it was a very good product for that time. Mike O'Leary uh, did the same thing in New Mexico. So these treatments have been around for a long time, is what I'm trying to say. And they, they continue to improve with new materials and the like. Now, we heard yesterday uh, about the treatments, uh, on, or, or the, earlier this week, about treatments used for concrete pavement preservation. Crack sealing, we saw a demonstration of crack sealing. And uh, we, uh, we didn't see down bar retrofit, but we did see a partial depth repair. Two set rates, one very fast, one very slow. We saw a bonded concrete overlays, uh, and that is another uh, treatment that is being used more and more 
in the industry. So treatments uh, used for concrete preservation, we heard discussions about them in the presentations. I know Schofield and others talked about all of these treatments and some of the improvements in test methods and construction procedures and things like that. Benefits, of course, that's the reason we're here, to identify benefits. We know preservation is cost effective, it's been demonstrated. I know LA County uh, reports the energy savings on all of their projects. They do 100% wrap with all their chip seals and slurry seals. Uh, they do almost all recycling, a lot of hole depth and cold in place recycling. So not only do they total up uh, the cost savings, but they also total up the energy savings. And they, uh, they are a lead state in using recycled materials. Reduced emissions, uh, we're, we're hearing about how we have to reduce emissions, and of course we're gonna have to report EPDs. Reduce user costs, uh, life extension, and then, like I said, both NCAT and uh, Minroad have demonstrated the life extension. The thing that's coming, though, is the sustainability and the resilience that was discussed earlier today. Sustainability is, is making sure you can reduce the gas out, green gas house emissions. And there are, there's going to be a considerable amount of money based on what I heard in uh, one of the sessions that is coming forward uh, that will be available to universities and other agencies to try to document the reduced emissions of preservation and other treatments. Now, what is the key to success for all of these treatments? One of them is project selection. Now, do you select your projects based on PCI, or do you uh, select your pro uh, projects based on distress? You can get different results uh, if you do uh, them side by side. I think David Peskin talked to this point, and I know we tried in our training at California to talk about the benefits of both PCI and distress when you select treatments. We always like to see pre-job meetings uh, between the agency and the contractor. Quality assurance. Uh, we like to see quality control plans, agency inspection. Rex Epperbally gave an update on some of the work that's been done by uh, the ETF on developing quality assurance guides for the various treatments. Again, Malthrop and I developed quality assurance guides for some of the treatments that we were, uh, and, uh, we were overseeing, such as chip seals, slurry seals, and micro systems. And of course, another thing is making sure you have effective communication, that you're on the same wavelength between the agency and the contractor, and that you have thorough documentation. That's not always the case with local agencies. I think state agencies might be a little better, but not all local agencies have the staff or the resources to provide, provide them. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities? Clearly documenting the benefits. We've got to make sure we clearly document the benefits of preservation. I, I sat in on one of the sessions with the city of Bend and they have the public talking about fix good roads first. The public actually, when they're out on the job, they look at these people working on good roads and they, they repeat, glad you're fixing our good roads. They, they've communicated with the public and the politicians to ensure there's trust and communication. They even get the politicians on the local TV station uh, as a, and for an interview and a photo op, and uh, the politicians, the city council, the city manager, they, they do that. They, they support, and, and as a result, they, they have just passed another uh, tax to uh, provide sustainable pres preservation. 
They've gone from about a 60 to an 80 on their network in six years. And if you didn't see it on that presentation, be sure you look at it uh, when you get the presentations from Todd. So, and again, uh, at, at Ben, they've, they've overcome that obstacle because the, the public expects you to fix good roads first. Uh, we have to adopt good QA practices and testing. Now, there may be good practices at some of the state agencies, but at local agencies, oftentimes they just don't have the staff to do that. We are developing national specifications, but they're not done for all of the treatment to date. Uh, as a part of the ETF, we've developed construction specifications, we've developed material practices, we've developed design practices for many of the preservation treatments. We still have more to do, or they still have more to do, because I'm no longer on the ETF, but uh, that's, that's ne nevertheless, I'm sure the new head of uh, the ETF will make that happen. If not, Colin will be on her back. Keeping preservation champions. You lose a champion in the state or an agency, preservation program might, uh, might just disappear. I had that in, uh, happen to me in Oregon. Uh, the District 4 uh, state engineer uh, was a big champion of CRR. When he and his, uh, his partner retired, the program disappeared. And uh, it was unfortunate because it was a good, good treatment for the eastern part of the state, which is high elevation and dry. And workforce development. We heard about workforce development and the need for people, not only at the engineering level, but also at the inspection level, but also at, at the construction level. We, 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 uh, we can't rely on colleges to provide a lot of information on pavements, much less pavement preservation. Someone said, I don't know who it was, said that the colleges provide a lot of information on pavements. We have 30 state colleges in, in uh, California and only two teach a pavement class and, I, and some of them just talk about pavement preservation. And one of them, of course, is ours. We have eight or nine University of California programs, and only one, UC Davis, has a program. So if you write uh, to, to any of these colleges, you, you'll find out that a lot of them do not have pavement programs and certainly do not teach pavement preservation. So we need continuous training, not only for inspectors, but also for engineers, because many of the engineers that are running a local agency or a state highway department have not had any payment training at all. And so we provide in, in our state, Ding provides a payment preservation academy and, and the city county payment improvements uh, uh, center provides certificate programs in payment engineering and management and in construction inspection just what is needed to try to get more qualified people uh, to, into the workforce. So shifting uh, from the worst to the first is convincing the public and politicians to spend maintenance dollars on good roads. Learn from what Ben did. Clearly communicating the benefits. It's not only life extension. I mean, we, we don't, I don't know if we really communicate clearly to local agencies of the life extension because, uh, because the, the pro, some of the programs just aren't expanding. And documenting that a mix of fixes it results in the be best network condition. If you mix some pavement preservation with some rehabilitation, oftentimes you're making the best choices. So, and I know we've done that for some counties in uh, California where we've looked at a mix of fixes to try to optimize their choices. Best, <clears throat> using best construction and uh, design practices. Again, strategy selection. When we first started this whole effort, it was the right road, the right treatment at the right time. 
But we should have another one using the right construction because a lot of the problems we have are either putting the road on the wrong, putting the treatment on the wrong road or having a substandard construction. And, uh, and I mean there are C teams out there if you haven't noticed. Mixed design is an art, not a science. I'd like to see some uh, improvement. I know in the ETF uh, uh, design practices, uh, we're developing new and improved uh, design procedures for uh, chip seals because a lot of people do not use a design procedure for chip seals. They just use uh, engineering experience. QC and uh, uh, quality control and agency acceptance extremely important because the agencies do not get what they spec all the time, they get what they inspect. And if you don't have inspection, you're doomed for failure in my opinion. In fact, I was in a project where we used some high mod uh, microsurfacings up in the high mountains in California and the first two projects went well because our team was on the, the, the project and watched the, the next, the third one, uh, there was no inspection, and of course the microsurfacing failed in the first year. Failed in the first year, uh, due to snow plows and due to poor construction practices. So the, I emphasize the need for a quality uh, control plan. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I emphasize the need for agency acceptance. I, I like a pre-job meeting. I like uh, sample it, this, it, it, and test at the discretion of the agency. Not only the emulsion, the aggregate, but also the mix. And we heard that from some of the speakers earlier this morning, testing the mix, particularly on slurry or microsurfacings. We test components, but we don't always test uh, the mix. And of course, identifying where and how and the fre frequencies and things are also important. We got to do better, the opportunities. There's still too many failures in some of the treatments, and we need to control the factors affecting field performance. We've demonstrated what we can get from Minroad and, and NCAT using good uh, contractors and inspectors. We need to document the performance of the various treatments. Uh, we're trying to, we're working on that. And as we said, workforce development is needed and training is needed at all levels. FHWA has done a lot in, through EDC, uh, when, what, and how. You heard Jason talking about that a little earlier. The uh, FHWA uh, technical feedback group uh, uh, headed by Tony, uh, uh, they've also done a lot, but I think a lot of the Grunt work has been done by the ETF in developing material specs, design practices, construction guides, and Q, including QA guides and best practices. And you can find those all on the National Center website. So uh, they have all of the, those documents. Now recent research to address some of these challenges, and you heard uh, some of that today. I think you heard about the, uh, from Mike Anderson about NCHRP project, or this week, uh, NCHRP project 963 on performance graded emulsions. You've heard, heard on uh, 1443 on construction guide specs for uh, cold in place recycling. I think you, uh, some of the other ones, uh, of course, were not discussed at, at this conference, but have been discussed at other conferences. And then uh, there's a curr currently a project out on aggregate embedment tests for chip seals, and that's not listed here, but uh, that still has not, the contract still has not been finalized, but uh, it's supposed to develop techniques to quickly monitor chip embedment and try to relate it to performance. If you have low chip embedment, what do you get? Rattling. If you have high chip embedment, you get flushing. So, that's the purpose of that test. And I can tell you for sure that Colin Franco had everything to do with all of those projects except for the first one, uh, first, the first ones listed. 
And if it weren't for him, those projects would not have been done. So here's some good re resources for you. Uh, you've seen them earlier. Uh, you'll see them here again. FP2, the Federal Highway Administration, NAPA, uh, NCPP, uh, ASHTO, CP2 Center. I don't know why I don't have uh, NCAT in there. I guess it's an oversight. Maybe it's because uh, they do so much work that everyone knows about them. And then RAP is an organization in the Western region. It's the Western Region Association of Pavement Preservation. And RAP contributes to FE2, but it holds an annual conference, uh, gets about 300 attendees, and they talk solely about pavement preservation, asphalt pavement preservation. There's uh, some of the red, uh, web sources for concrete pa pavement preservation. Iowa State has done a lot. IGGA has done a lot. Uh, FHWA has some uh, sources there and ACPA. I, I know I probably don't have all of them, but uh, these will get you started. So takeaways, and I'll, I just have a few more minutes here. Takeaways from the conference, what are they? What are the major takeaways? We've come a long way in the last 25 plus years. Preservation is now common practice, not only uh, from the National Center of Pavement Preservation, FHWA, but the regional partnerships, and the, those must continue. Agencies have improved their overall network condition. Many agencies have done this using a mix of fixes and, in, and using the data from their pavement management systems. We must continue to improve our practices and technologies to, in, uh, to increase use of preservation treatments. Doing more with less uh, and in, inflation and what have you, uh, we, we just need to get this resolved because agencies can't keep up with the inflation and keep up with maintaining the roads uh, with the funding they have. Performance and cost benefits of preservation uh, treatments are being documented. There's a lot of things that have been documented and they need to be publicized. They need to be publicized more. Get them to the politicians, get them to the uh, city councils, get them to people like that. The quality uh, assurance practices need to be implemented. We're trying to do, trying to do that through the ETF, but whether or not it'll uh, get implemented at local agencies is still difficult to say. Continue, continuous education on how to design, place, and inspect successful preservation treatments is underway. It reminds me of one of the comments that George said the other day. You plan a road, you design a road, is that right? You construct a road, and then what do you do? Do you remember what he said? Give it to maintenance and walk away. There's no feedback back to the other groups. So that, that was the quote that I remember from your presentation earlier. So, and then of course, the, the next major effort is going to tackle the calculations of the EPDs for preservation treatments. We, and that's gonna be a lot of money coming from EPA and FHWA and uh, people should get ready for uh, that flux of money. Moving forward, what do we want to do? Encourage more adoptions of the documents that the ETF is using because they're good for three years and then after that, they, they're provisional for three years and after that, if they're not used very much, they could disappear. So start using them. I know there are projects out there by managed by the National Center by Rex Epperly to try to encourage more states to uh, use those things. Fully incorporate pavement preservation into pavement management and agency business practices. Uh, preservation budgets are not keeping up with inflation and uh, we need to show off the successful case histories and one of the ones that I, I was impressed with was the one that the city of Bend, Oregon uh, did. And then continue to promote and expand the regional partnerships. That is the spear, and we want to make sure that gets out to 
not only the state agencies, but we need to include more uh, local agencies. So that is my wrap up. I hope I've done justice to wrapping up uh, these four days because there's a lot of good things and you just can't report on all of them in detail. So I was just trying to give you some takeaways. As George said earlier in his thing is B, and I don't remember what the B was or give, but I do remember the take, and that was the takeaways.